Hello. Good evening. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Doug Connect. I'm the uh, head of the School for Children and also Dean of Children's Programs here, which includes our Family Center. Uh, it's a wonderful program, too. Um, I am. I have the honor to open this evening and welcome you all to our space and um, the you know the person who says, "Wow, what an amazing partnership!" Um, these folks here have put together for this evening to share with you here in the space, and also we've also we've said that this will be recorded and shared with some of the larger community. So thrilled about that. Um, we have partners that are coming from the schools that you see here, but from Bank Street, from Calhoun, from Corlears, and Cathedral. Um, neighbor schools and uh, schools that we are excited to partner with today and perhaps more moving forward. It's a model for what we can do um, when we come together. I'm going to pass it to Maria for a moment yes. here. Yes, and, and we missed one of the C's, Calhoun. When we were organizing the banners, we were thinking like, do we, how do we? <laughs> well, welcome. My name is Maria Richa. I'm the diversity director here. I'm really excited to be here tonight and to actually have a live perform, perform no, a live, a live person <laughs> come here uh, and meet all of us. I think for us, it's sort of like, an opportunity uh, to come together uh, in that way. And uh, we're really excited for tonight. Um, it is an opportunity for us to come together and think about how we support you in helping your children navigate the world around them. Uh, recognizing that fair and unfair things happen in the world and how to be more compassionate and caring uh, individuals. We came together to do this work because all of our schools strongly support social justice work. And we value the collaboration with families since they are as essential for your children to become future leaders in this work. So welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Monsi Vasa, and I'm the assistant head of school and the director of equity and inclusion at Corlier School. And uh, before we introduce our speaker for tonight, we wanted to let you know that um, Dr. Bassley has shaped her presentation tonight on the wonderings that are emerging in our different schools, the themes and patterns that we're noticing um, that she will speak to us about tonight. But we also invite you, if you have a question that comes to mind while you're listening, we have some index cards that were available out front, and I also brought some in, and they're down here. Don't be shy. If you didn't grab one and you want to have one next to you, if you want to write down a question, um, Dr. Bassley has also generously given her time after tonight to respond to questions that might come up for you um, either in writing or by video. So please feel free to engage in that way as well. Um, we want to make sure that your, your questions get answered tonight. Okay. And without further ado, um, my colleague, oh, Alan, you're going to come up? All right. Uh, I'm just going to quickly introduce myself as well. I'm Alan Donaldson. Uh, I'm one of the DEI coordinators over at Cathedral, as well as 17 other hats as well. And I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing and learning from Dr. Baxley as well, as well as uh, all of our questions. So thank you, and um, we'll pass it over to John, who will introduce Dr. Baxley. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Gentili. I'm the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director at the Calhoun School. My pronouns are he, him, his. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker, Dr. Baxley. Let's give it up for Dr. Baxley. I'm like manifesting all the energy I needed today, um, this evening. So Dr. Tracy Baxley is a consultant, coach, prof and professor dedicated to supporting families, schools, organizations, and corporations in developing inclusive practices that lead to meaningful relationships a sense of belonging, and high productivity. As a belonging and inclusion advocate, she started Tracy Baxley Consulting as a diversity and inclusion consultancy to support organizations, teams, and leaders in developing inclusive practices and workspaces. She is also the creator and coach for social justice parenting, a parenting philosophy that moves families from fear-based parenting to parenting from a place of radical love through compassion and social engagement. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Baxley. Good evening, everybody. It is definitely great to be live. Yes. Um, 
I just want, before I get started, I want to say that I've had to practice everything that I'm going to share with you tonight. Uh, this morning, I had to come in this morning instead of yesterday because my son, son's soccer team was in the playoffs and I told him I would not miss that. So I changed my flight to this morning, thought it would be plenty of time, and I got to my hotel at 10 a.m. and they didn't let me in my room until 4 o'clock. And then I got out of the Uber just now and realized I left my Apple pen in the Uber. Um, and so all of that, I, the idea of active hope and radical love, I am manifesting that tonight, John. <laughs> and then the technology would not accept my computer, so we had to go to this computer. So if the words are a little bit off through the transfer of my computer to Maria, um, please send me radical love during that process as well. All right, so we will get started. Um, this is really going to be a kind of a quick overview of some of, if you've read the book, thank you. Um, and this stuff will be kind of a review for you, some of the big ideas in the book that we will use to answer your questions and then use as a springboard for us to have a dialogue. And then those of you who have not read the book, um, these are some of the big ideas that you will encounter when you get the book, right? So they're kind of the foundation of what social justice parenting was really all about. Um, as I created this through my own parenting and through my, uh, you know, my background as an educator, starting out in, in kinder as a kindergarten teacher in my 20s and through now as a uh, teacher educator in higher ed um, at the university in South Florida. So we're going to run through this relatively quickly because we want to save time, obviously, for, for Q&A. Um, but but what, what you're going to get here is kind of just kind of the meat of some of the big ideas. So this is a roadmap that we have for today. Um, the power of dialogue is so important. Um, so I really want us to get to that. But to get to that, I want to kind of set the tone here. And so what we're going to do is just kind of introduce the idea of radical love and what that is and how it's the foundation for really everything we do in our lives and the way that we show up in different spaces. And then we're going to get to core values. What are core values and why are they important to your family? Um, and the radical and love and the core value together really lead us into the rocks, which is the foundation of social justice parenting. And it's, it's almost like the action behind radical love and core values. And then we'll end with the idea of active hope. Active hope is what we use when things kind of get hard and kind of get sticky, how we kind of persevere through those hard things. All right, so um, I want to introduce the cuss of radical love because it, it is the way that we show up in the world. It's a choice that we make, whether we want to lead with radical love or not. Um, and radical love is really this kind of all-consuming, unconditional love that, that is full of grace and is full of forgiveness. And it is a love that reflects on the feelings and perspectives of people around us, right? So that we are listening to others, we are feeling each other, we are learning about their stories and their experiences. Um, and using those in ways that, that we show up in the world. It allows us to be safe in our own vulnerability. Uh, being vulnerable is a part of radical love. And, and being able to feel safe in that vulnerability, it also leads us to creating safe spaces for others to be vulnerable. So it's a love that shows up when things aren't, don't feel, that don't feel steady um, and that we get, we, we get steadiness through the people that are around us. It's fueled by compassion and understanding, and it promotes healing, it promotes growth, growth, and it helps us to support others when they are struggling and hurting. Um, and I think about that as a parent, I think about that as an educator, I think about that as a community member, how we're showing up for others um, in, the, in a time when things are not going great. Um, you think about the different communities that we're, we're seeing that are, are, are suffering. Um, you know, we just heard about the new, um, uh, 10 people, the shooting, right, the 10, 10 people that died in the shooting um, in, uh, during the Lunar New Year. So those are the places where we, we still should show up in radical love in some ways. Uh, radical love, you are actively listening to people around you, even when it's something that you don't want to hear, even when it's something that um, makes us not feel good in our skin, um, which we're having a lot of polar 
ideas going on in the world right now. And Radical Loves lets us sit in that for a little bit because when it comes down to it, the human, humans just want to be heard, right? And sometimes we have to sit in that even though it's something that we don't agree with. Um, Radical Love is very action-based, is action-oriented, is community-focused, um, and it really is this idea of creating space of belonging for everybody. And it really is this idea of love and action. Um, so it's how we show up, why we show up, um, and showing up in a way that we see the humanness in, in, in everybody. And because that's so important to us, if we walk in that space, which is not always easy, right? Sometimes it's very difficult to do. Um, but in those difficult times is when we should lean more into radical love than any other times. And when we are walking and leading with radical love, it's very important that we start to create these core values for ourselves and our families. Radical love really is the foundation for the, the why of our families. Core values really kind of help us see what's important, what's the legacy that we want to live for, leave for our children, those things that uh, when all else fades away, these are the principles that we want our children to stand on. And core values really are, I, I consider them like the GPS of the family, right? Because we all fall off, we all show up in ways that are not ideal. Um, that we want to take things back that we may say. I know when I'm screaming at my kids, the minute I'm done screaming, I realize that I kind of stepped out of our core values and I wasn't leading with radical love. And so my core values in our family really kind of bring me back to center. And so when we are living from a place of radical love, these core values are our driving force. So one thing I want to say about core values is that they are not stagnant, right? They are living, breathing documents where we are often uh, reshaping them as our children grow, as our values change a little bit, as the needs of our family shift. So when you're creating these core values for your home, it's really important that you make room for that, for that movement, you make room for the, for the active dialogue around those things. And I think it's also, we, we sometimes assume that our kids know what's important to us and we should not make those assumptions. We should be very um, explicit about what those core values are for our children, especially as they start to become teenagers. And we know kids' jobs are to push boundaries. And if we don't have kind of those core values, that GPS that kind of navigates our kids back to what's important to us, um, sometimes they lose their way. And so it's important to say, these are our core values. Let's come up with them together. Let's write them down. They're on the refrigerator. They're on the wall. Um, we're talking about them often at dinner time so that they are living, breathing documents in your home that kids can always go back to when things are not going according to uh, plan. So if we look at radical love and these core values as the what of parenting practice, the how or the action part are the rocks. So the rocks are reflection, open dialogue, compassion, kindness, and social engagement. Um, and I think when we sometimes parent through this lens of fear, and we know that fear has been stoked so, so much right now, um, you know, this, this, this fear, this political fear um, of what can happen, what's going wrong, what's wrong with the next group, why we shouldn't be with this other group, why we shouldn't listen to them, all these things that we're hearing that are circling around us, especially in, in the space of education. Um, the rocks really kind of help us to move beyond that fear into action with our children. And so I want to quickly just kind of touch on the rocks a little bit to really have us think about the how and the what and what, what it is we need to be doing to like create action around the idea of our core values and radical love, especially when things get hard. So there's three ways to look at how we show up in the rocks. You look at it through the lens of self, like how am I living the rocks? How is, how is this affect, this thing in the world affecting me and how am I showing that through how I show up um, in reflection and open dialogue and so on. The second one is through family. How am I using the rocks on or with my children in a way that I'm modeling what that looks like, especially when things get hard? Um, how are we living this in our daily life so it doesn't feel like an add-on but it feels like it's part of the foundation of who we are as a family. And then the third thing is from the lens of the community. How can I use the rocks to make my community better, 
how to make my community stronger, how to make it more equitable for everybody in the community. So as we're going through the rocks, as you start to, to think about the rocks in your own family lives, think about it in these three different forms, self, family, um, and community. So the R is for reflection. And while there's no single social, uh, rock that is more important than the other, I think it always starts with reflection. Because reflection is the way that we really start to think about the why we show up the way we show up. What in our childhood, what in our experiences, what um, our traumas, our fears, right? All of that really, how are those things really showing up for us as a parent? How is it, how is it presenting itself when you are speaking with your children or interacting with your children? So without reflection, it's pretty hard to work on all of these other pieces because we're not doing the internal work. And I have to say, when I'm working with families, uh, this is the one that people want to skip, right? But if we're not doing that internal work, it's really hard to be the best versions of ourselves for our children. So don't skip the reflection uh, part. And obviously, it's something that we do constantly. It's not something that's one and done or something that we can check off, that we're always revisiting and rethinking about the way that we showed up. The O is open dialogue. Um, open dialogue really requires us to be courageous and vulnerable, especially with our children. Um, we are not going to always have the right answers. We're not going to always have the answers. Um, and that's okay because in that vulnerability, our children get to see that they don't have to always have the answers too. Um, Sometimes when we are engaged with our children with open dialogue, it sometimes means we have to check our ego at the door because sometimes our children actually know more about things than we do and that we have to be okay with that too, that we don't always have to have the answers or always have the right answers. I know often when I'm talking to my children and I don't know the answers, I ask them for permission for me to circle back around, right? I need to do some more work. I need to process what you've said to me. Um, and then I make the point to circle back around. So it's okay to, to kind of take that pause, and it also gives your children to be able to do the same thing. I also get the, I guess one of the most asked questions I get from parents that I'm working with is, how early is too early, right? When do we start having those conversations? And the simple answer is, it's never too early, right? Everything is done age, in an age-appropriate way. Um, when they're younger, it may not be as explicit, you know, but uh, you are exposing them, you are discussing, you are talking about the things that are going on in their lives, you are reading books about different topics. So don't think that they're ever too year early. All the studies show that as early as six months, kids start to recognize race-based issues right away, right? They know where power, by the time they hit a preschool, they know where power lies in, in, in our society. Um, and they're able, to, they're able to use that and harness that. So the thing I say about open dialogue is if you're not doing the talking, they're getting that information from somebody else. And so do you want that information to come from your core values and through this lens of radical love? Or are you okay with them getting it from your neighbor, um, the internet, uh, your neighbors, their friends? So um, we should allow we should think about the fear of them getting it from somebody else outweighing the fear of us having some of these open conversations with their children. And then C is compassion. And compassion is like a moment. It's the moment where you are aware of somebody else's suffering um, and right before you take action. So it's that time in between recognizing that other people are hurting, um, and before you actually do something to relieve that that suffering. Um, and it is really, compassion is one that you can really look at it through these three lenses, right? I know for me, self-compassion is the hardest, it's the hardest part of the rocks for me because I'm offering that mean mom in my head, that mean girl is often telling me things that I'm not doing right or when I get it wrong. And so I have to really work on creating radical love around my own uh, talk. So um, when you think about compassion, the more compassion we give to ourselves, right, we're modeling what that looks like for our children. Um, and when you can give yourself compassion, it is easier to give it to your children or to the community around you. So really, uh, compassion really starts with ourselves. Um, when you live and you're creating a compassionate home, 
it's a home where everybody's voice is valued, right? Where your children can say. And I always say when kids don't get a chance to use their voices in our homes, they're not gonna be able to use it when they're out in the world. And we want them to be able to use their voices out in the world. So the way they learn to do that is through the mistakes that they make in our homes, right? Giving them the space and the grace to be able to do that at home in order for them to be able to stand up to things outside of our homes. And then compassion in communities really means how we come around, come together around a common um, issue or an idea so that everybody feels heard, everybody's uh, experiences matter, and we do that with, open, with an open heart and open mind. And so compassion is really the root of social justice work because it starts with this idea of seeing, seeing other people and seeing their, their lives um, and where they are. And it really is the, the beginning of harvesting a life of service with your children. And then the final thing is, is I mean, sorry, not the final thing. The fourth thing is, is kindness. And kindness is compassion and action. So it's where you're going from feeling somebody's suffering to really trying to do something about it. Um, and in 2014, there was a Harvard study called The, Ch the Children we, we Want to Raise. And they um, did a survey with children to ask what the children thought were the most important things for, for their parents. And 80% 80, 80 of the children who were surveyed basically said that they thought their parents valued grades and things over kindness, their children being kind um, and compassionate. And then in 2020, there was a study done by Parent Magazine that said, that asked parents, what was the most important quality that you want your kids to have? And the majority of the parents, the number one thing was kindness. And so this disconnect between what our kids think we want and what we're saying we want is very great. And so then you have to start thinking, how do I begin to show my kids in a way that I really do value kindness. I really do value that they're compassionate um, and not just that they are doing well on the basketball court or that they are getting an A in science. Um, so we have to start thinking about how we can use kindness in a way that bridges that gap between what our kids think are important to us um, and what we think uh, the things that are important to us. Um, and then finally, I want to say about kindness is that there are a lot of studies in neuroscience that really say you don't even have to be the giver or the recipient of kindness. Just watching the act of kindness, the neurons in your body have the exact same um, result, right? That, that feel good, that happiness hormone. Um, you don't even have to, have to be a part of it. Just seeing it um, is enough for our, for, for our children to benefit that, benefit. And the happier our children are, right? the more adjusted they are, the more that they're able to spread that to other people. And so I think making sure that we are being kind to ourselves, making sure we're being kind to our children, and teaching our kid, kids the habit of kindness to others is really important. And the last one is social engagement. Um, this, is the, this is the building block that people say they want to do, but seems to be the hardest to get get people going on this. Um, and our children won't have a life of service if they're not learning it from us, right? And so I think when we look at, at in history, and I think about like uh, the social, um, the, my brain, the civil rights movement, right? It was the children, right? The, ch the children's crusade that really started the whole movement um, when I look at gun control, I, I'm from South Florida, and I think about the kids from the Stone, Stoneman Douglas shooting, right? They took the stage and they shared their spotlight with students or children in Chicago, um, Detroit, all these places where gun violence is like normalized in their communities. They, sh these privileged white suburban children thought it was important to share that stage with um, other children who, who, who who see this, this kind of um, violence every day. Um, also, I think about Malala, right? She really was on a crusade to, to change the way girls are educated. So when you think about the movements in, in society during, through history, it really was young people that really kind of started a lot of, this, a lot of the movements and who, who got our attention. And, and I think about also 
Greta for, for the environmental education. So the more our children are seeing us engage in social justice work, um, the more our children will, again, it becomes normalized for our children. And it, be, it becomes just the thing that we do because, because of who we are, because of the core values that my parents have, have uh, raised us to have. Um, so I think it's important that you model the behaviors that you want your kids to do. What kids see the most of is what they do uh, in, their, in their daily lives. And so the more we can model this behavior of being involved, being active. And I think some people get, a, get uh, like deer in headlights when it comes to like activism, but we have to look at activism in, in, a bit, in very different ways, right? Activism is not always being on the front line, right? It's sometimes, it's, I think parenting itself is activism. Even what you're doing in your home, I, I'd say what we do in the quiet, the quiet spaces of our home shows up in public spaces, right? So if we are teaching our kids in our homes, they're going to be able to do those things out in the world. And so the last thought I want to leave you with is active hope. Sometimes we want to do all of these things, but sometimes it gets very tough, right? Or we have this fear around speaking up, standing our ground, um, or going against the grain or going against status quo. But when we look at social justice in its simplest form, it really is about human rights. And so we can look at it through the lens of these are basic human rights that everybody deserves. And what is our responsibility as human beings, right? Raising human beings, what is our responsibility in, in assuring that we have, everybody has some kind of social justice um, life? And I know this idea of social justice has really been kind of weaponized lately. Um, even, I even get people emailing me all the time. It's like, why did you choose the word social justice? You know, people are not even going to read the book just seeing social justice. Why didn't you just say it's compassion parenting or whatever, you know? And I think I'm, I really want to take that word back because social justice is really about how do we help people have the best lives that they can, the most opportunities that they have. How do we um, give access to opportunities? How do we give access uh, for growth? Right? Like education. How do we give um, opportunities for um, equity? You know, making sure that people vote, making sure that people um, have what they need to eat and to drink. Um, those are like base, they have shelter. Those are basic things and those are all part of social justice. So I would like for us to kind of take back the word social justice and use it with our kids in a way that how are we helping human beings be the best human beings that they can be? And I think this idea of active hope and us being active hope keepers, um, we can model those things for our children through, through the rocks, through talking about it, through having dialogue around our, our core values. Um, and active hope is an action, right? It's something that we do. It's having this, this idea of wanting things better, but not just wanting it bad, better passively, but really putting some things in action. And no matter how small, small actions really have big rippling impacts. So don't think any act that you do is too small to, to engage in. But um, little things over time make big differences. And so really, just as a quick wrap up, it all begins with radical love, right? Seeing the humanness in all of us, um, open up our hearts and our minds uh, for in spaces so that we can hear everybody's stories. Um, and then that creates uh, what we could, core values in our own houses that are really grounded in this idea of radical love. And um, it's a way that we guide our kids in decision makings and the decisions that they make in their lives. Um, and those core values show up in action through the rocks. Um, it's, the rocks are evidence to the world that we are living a life of radical love. And then finally, the active hope really supports us living those core values when things get hard and things get sticky and sometimes we feel hopeless. The active hope gets us to, make, to do some kind of small action to keep us going to know that um, the more we do, um, even when it's hard and sticky, um, the better world that we're really leaving for our kids.
Thank you, Dr. Baxley, uh, so much. Thanks, that was wonderful. Um, and as I sit here and look at the place where I was going to introduce myself was moved up from the end towards the middle, and then I did it at the beginning. Uh, I really want to thank you for starting Dr. Baxley with radical love for yourself. And then I want to thank you both for handling that with such grace as I just threw that in there in the middle. Um, here's where I was going to introduce myself, but I won't do that again. I will say um, one of the things that I think we all share as institutions and as families at Bank Street and Corlears and Calhoun is that we're at places that are doing this work and are eager to do this work. Um, and that's wonderful and a two-edged sword uh, at times. And so I, I really was noting when you're talking about the for example, how we all like to skip the reflection part, um, how you know the distri distribution of power is needed, and th those things are sometimes difficult, um, even when we think we're on this path. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit for those of us at, at these kind of institutions that want to walk the walk and have begun this work, um, going beyond you know compassion to kindness, but actually kindness to actions of justice. How does that look like as families and institutions? Yeah, I think it's important for us to recognize that we are all on our own journeys. Um, and it's you can't compare your journey to somebody else's journey. But I also think that we can't get complacent um, and be okay with being comfortable, right? So I think the work of allyship, the work of social engagement, it really is all about being a little bit uncomfortable um, because it means that you're pushing yourself to grow and to learn to unlearn, to relearn, um, and I think that's really important. And so, I, my thoughts are, if you're feeling comfortable with what you're doing right now, then you're not doing enough, right? Um, and what would be the next step for you, as a family, as an individual? I think it's really important, too, that the schools, and I know you guys are already doing the work, I mean, it's nice to be preaching to the choir, you know? Um, but I think, as a, as a school, as a unit too, it's important to have space that you can also push people on their journeys. Um, I, 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 I do this exercise in some of my workshops with, with parents um, on, it's like a scavenger hunt. And so if you guys want me to send you the documents, please let me know. So I ask you to really do some work in your community, right? Finding that area that you're passionate about. Finding um, organizations in that area in your community that are already doing the work, right? So nobody's asking you to reinvent the wheel, right? So you want to find groups of people like-minded who are already doing the work that can push you to the next level or to um, push you along in your journey. Um, one of the things I ask you to do is research uh, organizations in your neighbor, in your in your community. Um, join one of those organizations. Um, don't try to take over the organization, but really find out what it is that they need, right? Because sometimes we look at things from our own perspective and we don't take the time to think about it from the people um, who we're trying to work with and work for and work, work uh, stand next to. Um, so I think you should be doing a little bit of digging about where, what you're already doing, what would be the next step for you and your family, and what already exists in your neighborhood, in your communities, in your schools that you can, to be a, you can be a part of. Um, and I think it's also important for us to stay in that space of reflection, um, because the minute we get complacent, we're no longer adding to um, making the world a little bit better. And so think about where you are and, and think about what would be a good next step for you. Um, because I know there's fear around that sometimes. A lot of that fear is about getting it wrong, right, or saying the wrong things. And I think spaces like this, where we can have the dialogue that are safe spaces to get it wrong and to, to lovingly, right, be told that it's wrong um, and being okay with accepting it's wrong. And that's another thing that I, I, when I send people out to be allies in the world, when you make a mistake, don't dwell in it, don't sit in it, apologize for it, figure it out so you don't do it again and then move on. So th those are some of the kind of initial ideas that I would think about, you know, taking some action steps.
thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Wagsley. Um, in connection to that and thinking about our schools, when you were talking about open dialogue, um, it made me think a little bit about how you know the open dialogue that's happening at the home also is happening in schools, right? We're, we're trying to create safe spaces in classrooms to have open dialogue, and sometimes there is there are conversations that maybe emerge in school before they emerge at home or emerge at home before they emerge in school. And so how, you know, how can we work together around that open dialogue piece and ensuring we're moving along together um, on that path? Yeah, I don't know if you're ever gonna really be together on that, you know, because we're all coming from different lived experiences and different places in our journey. I think the key to that is really the, this idea of safe space, right? It's hard to have open dialogue when you don't feel safe and you don't feel valued and you don't feel heard. So I think before we can have open dialogues, uh, open dialogue, there needs to be a real nurturing of, of, of safe space. And with that nurturing, right, because of my lived experience, my safe space is gonna look very different from your safe space. And so I think Having, having conversations around what does safe space look like um, so that we are trying to pull these resources together when people are coming from different backgrounds, different lived experiences, um, to create safe space. And I, and, I, and I think one of the things that I think about is when you are creating safe spaces, it's really important that people's lived experiences are valid, are valid and valued. Um, I can think of a lot like uh, at, at the university where I work, I am the advisor for uh, a club. It's called the Sister Circle. So they're all black female students who are in the doctoral programs in the College of Education. And I would say 80% of those students found me because of the microaggressions. Right? When, or they were told, you're making a big deal of this. It's not that important. Um, why are you so angry? Those kinds of things. And so their lived experiences caused that for them. And when it wasn't validated by some of my coworkers, um, the need for the sp safe space was, uh, was created. Um, and then I felt like I needed to be the one to go to my colleagues to say, okay, this is, this is real for them. Um, so I think having people at the school who can really validate the lived experience for, for all of the parents and then um, deciding what safe space looks like based on the population of your parents is really important. And then I think when people feel safe, the open dialogue can happen. Do you have anything on that? Sure. <laughs> when you were reflecting, you're like right next to me. <laughs> When, we, uh, when you were reflecting about self, how important it is to do that groundwork, right? For yourself as a parent, as educators, it's so important for us as well to reflect on our own practice, to reflect on who we are, what do we bring to our classroom. And we are developing children and their identity. So thinking about what is the role in schools in supporting a child's identity development, alongside with what is the role or the symbiotic relationship that's happening at home. Um, can you reflect a little bit on that? Yeah, I, I, I want to start off by saying thank you to all the educators. It's a very undervalued career, and the world needs you, um, if there's any educators here. <laughs> But I also think it's important as an educator, like you say, to do the reflection, right? Because we all have biases. And the minute you say you don't, then you're not doing any reflection, right? Um, we all have it uh, because of our lived experiences, because of who we are, because of the way we were raised, because of the traumas in our lives, whatever those things are. When we can recognize those things, even if you're not changing them, just to be able to recognize those and to, to think about how they're impacting the way you're showing up for students or your own children really is huge. Um, and I think once we are able to kind of say, I do have a bias, like one of the things I do with my undergrad students, I, I say, okay, this young black boy is coming into your, in your classroom, what are the first things that you think about? 
who he, who he is, who he could be. There's an Asian um, girl coming in your classroom. What, what are the experiences that you think you're going to have with that student? Um, and so obviously we create safe space around that for them to be able to tell their truths. But the very stereotypical things come out, right? And so that we are identifying these kids with an identity that may not be theirs. And so I think it's really important that we start to do the work on unpacking our own so that we can get to know our students, really get to know our own children really too, to let them identify who they, who they are. Um, and through that, we get to know how to nourish that, how to teach them how to self-advocate around those things. But I think giving people space to identify who they are is really important. Um, and I know there's a lot of controversy right now, which I think we're gonna get into perhaps, with the whole idea of diversity and inclusion in schools, right? We are, and I live in Florida, so if you know anything about Florida right now, um, it is not really fun for somebody who does the work that I, that I do, right? But I also think we have to think about, it's not just this isolated diversity and inclusion, right? It really is social emotional learning. Um, and in part of that social emotional learning, it is about how kids identify, how we support them in identifying who they are, how to um, self-regulate, how to self-identify, how to self-advocate. And I think if we look at it through the lens of helping our children get through these social emotional parts of who they are, we can see that we are also supporting them in, the, in them learning who they are um, as individual as an individual with all of these different varying di diversities and different varying identities. So I think looking at the person through a social emotional lens can really kind of help us take a dive into what does that look like for them and their identity um, and then doing the internal work um, is really important as well. Um. Dr. Baxley, um, it's, a interest, it's a nice segue into this idea. So our schools are striving to do identity development work, and we're engaging in conversations on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and we're also schools in New York City, which have had their own legacy of resistance and pushback and ending up in the paper. Um, and you know, Not as much as us. <laughs> Not as currently, um, um, and so I'm wondering um, what speaks to me is this idea that each family comes with their own set of core values, and our schools often have a set of core values, and sometimes those may actually be incongruent, um, and yet some people believe in the larger mission of private schools, um, and I'm wondering with the resistance that we're seeing nationally, locally. Um, how, how should schools be approaching? Is there, is there a way to reset? Is there a way for us to really sort of reconsider, um, you know, uh, you said we, we need to reclaim social justice as a, and maybe reframe it for families or engage in different dialogue. I'm wondering, have you thought about this? Like what's a reset, what's a, what's a reimagining together? Yes, I thought about this a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, especially now because of again, what's going on in the school systems in Florida where everything is being pulled out, everything's being banned, all the curriculum is being changed, um, content is being pulled out. Just last week, I don't know if you guys saw or read, um, our governor just signed a proposal and it just passed in our college education that there will be no, um, no schools in Florida able to offer AP African American studies um, at all in any high schools, right? So it's always on my mind. And so, I, th there's two schools of thought for me, and I waver back and forth. <laughs> Sometimes I want to be very radical, standing firm in what I believe. Like I tell my husband all the time, babe, this is the hill I'm willing to die on. Like I don't know what this is going to be for my career, I don't know what this means, but this is the hill I'm going to die on. Um, and I don't want, I'm not going to change what I teach, I'm not going to change who I am, I'm not going to stop um, standing up for people who's, I think, human rights are being violated in a lot of ways. And so to me, that's one way to do it. Like we're, we're fighting back, right? We are writing the letters. We are going to our school board meetings. We are um, voting. Um, we are getting other people to vote. We're getting other people to stand up. We're, we are um, creating um, agents of change um, and that we are being very, um, 
dogmatic about it in a lot of ways. So that's the one school of thought that I often subscribe to. <laughs> um, the other one is sometimes sugar helps the medicine go down, right? So sometimes there are buzzwords that come out into the universe that are all of a sudden negative words, like critical race theory, right? So that's a whole, that's a, that's a workshop on its own. <laughs> really explaining what critical race theory is and the way it's being used in schools, it's, it's not the same thing. Okay, but, so now that is a buzzword that people don't want to hear. And so sometimes we have to navigate through these buzzwords, these words that are stoking fear, and still do the work. And so right now, currently, I am writing a curriculum around the rocks, and it's a social emotional learning curriculum and framework that there are school districts that want me to come and do that. And so it's still gonna be wrapped in radical love. It's still gonna be wrapped in social justice. It's still gonna be wrapped in this idea of, of um, culturally responsive teaching. Um, but it's gonna have the words that make it so that people are saying, oh, this is what our kids really need. Um, and so I say, you know, you have to figure out where you sit with that um, and what makes sense for you in that moment, um, whether it is digging in and using those words that are causing people's hairs on the back of their necks to stand up and say, because it's the right thing to do, or still do the work, um, but make it a little bit easier for people to be able to understand and to, to, um, to accept where you are and what you're, what you're teaching. So, you know, you have to decide um, where you are on that, um, and if where you are changes, you know, depending on the topic, depending on the time period. But, let me say this, you have to keep doing the work, right? You can't not do the work. You can't allow people who don't want to do the work to be louder than the people who are trying to do the work, right? People who are trying to be more inclusive, people who feel like representation matters, that hi real history matters, um, that everybody has a right to be safe in schools and be seen. Um, we have to make sure that if we sit in that camp that we are louder than the people who are denying people, I think, basic human rights. Thank you. I think we're going to take the microphone. Uh, we could probably take two or three more questions, so I could take one side. We didn't plan for this, but it's going to happen. <laughs> right Do you want and to I'm reserving the sure. right to say I don't know the answer. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>
the faster you can keep up with the changes. But they're, they're always changing, um, and we're always going to get it wrong, but it, I think that's okay, too. That is a great question. I, I want to kind of touch on what you said in the beginning about the self-selection part. Um, Margaret Hagerman, who's a sociologist, I think she's at Mississippi State maybe, she wrote a book, it's called White Kids, but she, heard, she did a study where she followed these middle class white suburban families who had children, I think from the age of 10 to 13, for two years. She went to their soccer practices, she went to their homes, she helped them with homework. She even drove some of them to their practices, right? Really embedded herself into the lives to see how they learned about race. And one of the things, one of the big things that themes that came out of her, her, her study is she talked about these things of bundled choices. So I am going to buy a house in this community. This house is going to now tell me what school I'm going to go to. That school is now going to basically tell me who my kids' friends are. My kids' friends are now going to be the carpool people that we ride to soccer practice with. That soccer team is now the expanded group that my kids invite over to our home, right? So we make one decision, and those decisions impact the whole social dynamic of our children. And so once we start realizing that we have created this bundle, bundle of choices, we have to make the conscious effort to start unraveling those. And through that, we start to think about how do I then get my kids involved in something that's not in our neighborhood, right? How do I take my kids, maybe I have to drive 20 extra minutes, 30 extra minutes to take them, to put them in this dance team or to have this music uh, instructor or tutor. How do we then start thinking about Maybe we're going to the library, not in our neighborhood, but go over to another neighborhood to go to their story time or their library time. So we have to be very intentional about unraveling those bundles that we've now created for our kids, which is kind of this cocoon, really. Um, and I think part of that, again, is joining these communities that are outside of our kind of comfort zone, right? If we're trying to be allies, if we're trying to show our kids that there's different ways of showing up, different ways of thinking, different groups that we can support through our privilege, uh, whatever those identities of privilege are, um, we have to make conscious efforts that are harder. They may take more time and effort, but then I have to put the onus back on you how important it is to you, right? Um, and so it, it requires us to unravel some of the things that we are comfortable with in our own lives in order for us to make that connection for our kids outside of our own bubbles. And I think also, especially during, I know during the election time, people who are in my kids' circle, when conversations started happening, because they only talked about school and basketball and those fun things, well, during the election time, they then start having the conversations that they're having in their own homes, and they realize that there are a lot of differences between them and the people that, you know, may be at their schools. And so I think that's when you lean into those uh, open dialogues, right, those hard conversations with their children. Um, I know a lot of the parents that I work with, they are finding that they are having to have those conversations with their ch children about their extended family, right? We're going to grandma's house for Thanksgiving. Her values, her core values are very different from ours. This is what we believe in. Let's talk about our core values in our homes. Let's role play what that looks like when we're outside of our home. What if she says this to you? What if he says this to you? What are some things, I call them back pocket talk, right? What are some things that we can put in our back pockets that you don't have to think about when you're in the company of other people, but that you can stand up for yourself in a way that's respected, respectable, um, but that you feel comfortable with? The other thing that I think is really important, and this is not 100% on what you're saying, but I think it's important for our kids. We want to teach them radical love, compassion, and kindness, but, not but, and we need to teach our kids how to hold their own boundaries, 
right? So we don't want our kids to be the ones that are always a scapegoat for somebody else because they're so nice and kind and compassionate. But we also want to teach them that, yes, being compassionate is part of our core values. But also, when you get yourself in a situation where you don't feel uncomfortable, where you feel uncomfortable, where you feel like you are being threatened in some way, it's okay to say, I understand what you're saying, I hear what you're saying, um, I don't agree with that, and, and it's okay for us to disagree. Thank you for telling me your values and your opinions. They're different from mine, and it's okay for us to be, be okay with us not um, agreeing on things. So I don't want your kids to think they always have to um, necessarily find consensus. Um, but that they can also have boundaries around that as well. Yeah, I, I, I guess the, the, the immediate word that jumped into my mind was intentionality, right? We can't wait for things to happen. We can't wait for other people to do it, that we have to be very intentional about scheduling. Um, one of the things in what that scavenger hunt that I have people do is to look in their community and find something going on. Something that they would never normally do that's outside of their comfort zone. Write it on your calendar that you're going to show up to that thing. The same way we do for parties, the same way we do for all the other things in our lives. You have to protect that time, protect that space. Because when you look at the lives that you are creating for your children, if that is something important to you, just like their social life is, you have to be intentional about protecting that space. Um, and I, I do, I see a big difference in just in the people that follow me or the people that I work with. People are like putting their, they're taking their foot off the gas a little bit, right? And we are allowing um, that moment in time to not be as present as it is right, as it should be right now. And so you are right in, in thinking back to 2020 and where we are in 2023, and we are not doing as much. And I think really being intentional with that, um, really creating spaces like this where you have conversation about what is our next step, going to your equity directors and say, I'm ready for us to do something else. What do we do? going to school board meetings and, and, and be having a presence of people who are thinking differently, I think are, are, are really important starting steps. But I think your diversity and equity people, they need to feel like they're supported too. Um, and I think just being at the school is not enough because you are with like-minded people, but that we have to move through the rocks into the active hope, into the social engagement part, and saying to our equity leaders, what do we need to do? What are our next steps? Here are some ideas that we have. Can we create something around, around that? And I think um, being intentional about that and really um, putting the light, shedding light on that is really important for us to stay present, right? To, 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 to I just think sometimes we walk in spaces too quietly. Um, and I think if we're always allowing other people to make the most noise, the squeaky wheel is going to get oiled, greased, whatever it is, right? And I think let's not just be nice, but bring our nices in a way that it is proactive and it is seen and it's heard. Thank you again, Dr. Baxley. Um, so we want to invite everybody um, to uh, come up to the lobby um, where there are some uh, beverages as well. Dr. Baxley will be signing some books. Um, and we also invite you to look at the exhibit up there that was uh, is, uh, activists um, inspired that have inspired Bank Street uh, staff and faculty over the years so please come up there come with your questions I think we still are collecting questions as well for for gathering for Dr. Baxley for after so um, thank you again I'm going to pass it over to you but thank you so much for hosting as well uh, yes. thank you everyone for coming the refreshments are around the corner behind this wall and we'll take a moment to your gatherings and then we'll uh, set a table for you we have a few more books uh, that are for sale tonight if you 
didn't have a chance to purchase it ahead of time, um, you're welcome to do that as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It was such a pleasure.